first joined NGE in June 2011 as a program officer before assuming his current role. Prior to joining NGE, he served as a research associate and academic resources coordinator at the Near East South Asia NESA Center for Strategic Studies, a regional research center of the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. Prior to his time at the NESA Center, James worked in Taiwan for over seven years at overseas radio and television, a non-profit Christian media organization based in Taipei. James also served for a year in the Republic of China Taiwan Army. James has a master's degree in international relations and security from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service with a focus on East Asian security issues and a bachelor degree in information systems from the University of Venezuela Watchtown School. Please continue. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you once again uh, so much to the Venerable Didagu Siada uh, for co convening this conference and also to our partners, the Myanmar Council of Churches, the Catholic Bishops Conference of Myanmar, and the Judson Research Center. Uh, it is such uh, an honor and a privilege for IGE to be able to hold this event with all of you. And uh, already I'm starting to see just uh, some amazing results and just very uh, piercing insights from all the speakers today. So thank you very much. I thought today that I would discuss the topic of uh, security, peace, and coexistence from more of a practitioner standpoint, uh, given my role as uh, heading up the overseas programs at IGE, and also to look at it from a little bit of a, a little bit of a geopolitical <coughs> stance as well. Um, so just a few words about my own personal background. I, as you can tell, I'm uh, obviously not a Caucasian American. <laughs> Um, my, my family is originally from Taiwan, but I was born in the United States and grew up in New York. Uh, so I think uh, you know the United States as uh, encompassing many different ethnicities and religions, and uh, myself, uh, Chris Seipel, uh, Christy Vines, who you heard from earlier, that we could all serve on the same organization in tandem. Um, this uh, in a sense, also illustrates a kind of um, uh, the ideal that we are looking towards. Uh, IGE's work overseas, uh, what we try to do is to build sustainable environments for religious freedom through local partnerships. And this religious freedom is legally protected and culturally owned. So how do we do that? We try to equip government officials to engage and harness the strength of religious communities and helping the people to use that freedom responsibly. And when we say religious freedom, uh, we are talking about a society where all the different ethnic and religious groups are celebrated and not just tolerated, and I've heard this from other speakers previously, and that mutual respect exists between them. It also implies a consensus where every religious and ethnic group has a capacity to contribute to the common good without the need to compromise their most fundamental beliefs. So, uh, how does this work in practice? IGE, over the, uh, the decade, uh, actually over a decade of, of um, our operations and our founding, uh, we've come to develop a methodolog methodological framework which we've um, just developed piece by piece as we've uh, worked in different countries, and basically it begins with showing up and listening to all sectors of society, government, grassroots, religious, and civil society. In IGE parlance, we, we call this showing up and shutting up. Uh, that means that we, uh, we come there to seek to listen, we seek to gain a comprehensive understanding of the situation from different perspectives. And you can do no less if you hope to have people take you seriously. 
Next, we seek to identify like-minded organizations, <coughs> agencies, and individuals who see religious freedom not only as the right thing to do, but also in a country's self-interest. As you know, uh, it's very easy for uh, people to demonize or to stereotype or generalize uh, certain countries or governments, but we know that nothing is a monolith. There's always good, uh, good people, people that love their country, whether it's in the government or it's in uh, different religious uh, organizations or denominations, that want to seek, uh, that are seeking towards a true common good and towards the betterment of their fellow man in the society. So we try to uh, seek to identify these organizations. Uh, and to our blessing, uh, the Didagu uh, Seattle uh, is one of them, um, doing wonderful things here in Myanmar. And uh, as we establish these partnerships, um, uh, we try to continue to listen, and we try to make the case that a country which is able to bring about this kind of religious freedom, where there's mutual respect uh, between different religious and ethnic groups, uh, not only is that the right thing to do, but it also leads to greater uh, economic development, it leads to greater social stability, it leads to greater women's participation in society. And this is backed up by research uh, done by organizations such as the, the Pew Foundation. And in other words, religious freedom is associated with economic prosperity, stability, and ultimately national security. Uh, religious freedom, you can also say, from a more geopolitical perspective, is uh, uh, also a source of soft power. Uh, now, in my experience at IGE, I have worked uh, on certain, uh, on a couple of projects that we have in China. <laughs> and as you know, well, some of you might know, uh, China is seeking to uh, boost up its soft power. They're spending lots of money on creating uh, news stations, on uh, just kind of top-down efforts to try to improve their soft power, but they're discovering that that doesn't work. And I think it's because uh, soft power ultimately needs to be bottom up as well. It needs to be uh, present in the people, in the way that people interact with each other in society, in the way that different groups uh, carry on their relationships with each other. So I thought in the case of uh, Myanmar, uh, you know, I think at this juncture, at this critical point of transition, your soft power, uh, you see, uh, is on the rise. You know, you see um, this opening. There's uh, an excitement, a palpable excitement in the international community about the possibilities for this country. Uh, and you know, with, with organizations like the ones that we've been working with and partnering with, uh, we see that. Um, but on the other hand. Um, this is a, a paper that I picked up in my hotel that I stayed in. It's, it's, the, um, it's actually the Chinese language uh, newspaper. And I, I would think that probably mostly Chinese you know, speaking communities, uh, overseas ones, would read this. But it basically says that uh, the UN calls upon Myanmar to pay attention to the Rohingya. Um, now, of course, you know, the issue isn't that this is appearing in the newspaper. Uh, or that it's being talked about in the UN. But um, I just find it interesting that it's actually appearing in a Chinese language newspaper. And so it's not only amongst the, the Western community, but just basically all around the world that um, this issue uh, is being discussed and considered. And so when we talk about soft power, um, this, this is kind of, this is a, is a factor as well. Um, you know, one of the other countries you work on um, is Vietnam. And when you look at just the different, um, just the, the, the nuance, the, the subtle relations between how China, Vietnam, even Myanmar uh, goes, uh, you can see uh, an element of balancing in effect uh, as China rises. But you can also see, I, I would think that soft power plays a big part in that, the, the soft power of the, uh, of the United States that even gives it, uh, allows it an opportunity to be used as a way to balance against the PRC. So anyway, uh, I, I just uh, offer that for your consideration. Uh, so once we identify these like-minded organizations, we establish local partnerships and we work together to establish a safe space where government, grassroots, 
and religious leaders can come together and engage in open and honest exchanges. <coughs> this leads to the breakdown of stereotypes and the building of mutual trust. Parties that do not only talk to each other uh, can be at the same table and given an equal voice. Uh, and one thing that really struck me just before in the panel was uh, His Eminent Al Hajj Wu Waibun. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name terribly. Uh, but you, you mentioned uh, the situation in Tangoya that's coming in, and you, um, and you directly addressed the, 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 his venerable uh, Speku Siyadao. And, and he said, uh, I'll go there to see. And what struck me about that was that. Uh, that this was taking place in this forum, and uh, the Sita who, uh, he was fine with, the, with that. Uh, in, in other places, uh, an exchange like that would be too sensitive, or viewed as offensive, or, um, uh, or could just cannot take place at all, because they would not be in the same room. So, uh, so the fact that this forum, I already see the first steps towards uh, this kind of safe space being established, uh, that is also really a, a point of encouragement to me, and hopefully for, for everyone here. So once we have a safe space, uh, what do we do? We uh, try to encourage the production of indigenous scholarship, scholarship which demonstrates how religious freedom is beneficial to security and prosperity, and is also consistent with the local culture. Religious freedom isn't a Western uh, value, uh, or at least it shouldn't be viewed as that, but in some places, that's perception. Every culture uh, has, uh, every culture, every religion has the teaching of welcoming uh, the other, or of, of hospitality, or of um, reaching across, building bridges. And so, how do you, um, how do you get the scholarship uh, that that demonstrates, that proves that point? That's that's what um, that's what the safe space leads to. And once you have that scholarship, it forms a a foundational resource for policymakers and opinion leaders to start to affect change in state and society. New standards for education and training can be developed, and with this new education, educational standards, you can uh, begin to change mindsets, which lead to change behaviors. Those who undergo these training programs eventually coalesce into a network that helps the state and society to develop laws and policies and to inform these processes that cultivate uh, social harmony and protect religious freedom. So I want to offer a concrete example, and this is actually related to this whole uh, gathering we have here. Um, in 2005, uh, or before you correct me, uh, I actually published a book uh, on religion and security, this very topic. Uh, and this book was uh, noticed by uh, a government think tank in China called the Institute for Ethnic Minority Groups. And they wished to, uh, to translate this into Chinese because uh, at that time, they were struggling with the issue of the ethnic uh, and religious minorities within their own borders. Uh, you know, for example, the, the Uyghurs uh, in, in Xinjiang or, or the Tibetans. So they, they approached IG about this. We held, uh, we ended up holding a conference about the topic. And this conference led to uh, a series of three conferences uh, in three different provinces in Western China with substantial Muslim populations. And this conference series ended up being called Muslims in a Harmonious Society. And it was uh, the safe space where the local uh, Muslim leaders were on, at the same table with local party and government officials. And that had never been done before. Uh, and it gave them an opportunity to get to know each other and to break down walls. And uh, they were able to talk about how Muslims could contribute to a modern society in China. They could talk about the local initiatives that, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, imams were taking to engage with the local party officials and potentially serving as a model to other provinces. Um, so this whole series of conferences culminated in, in a final and a concluding conference in, in Beijing. And during this conference, we had uh, officials and uh, religious leaders from three different provinces, including Xinjiang, uh, where there's been a lot of unrest. And we had officials from, from Gansu and Sanxi uh, basically uh, telling the Xinjiang officials uh, that 
uh, they're basically criticizing them for the policies um, as, as being kind of productive. Um, so you see, you know, so this is something you normally wouldn't hear about. Now, when you talk about Xinjiang and China, you, you hear about the bad government and you hear about you know, the oppressed Uyghurs. And while that, uh, you know, that is the true, there's also some other things which are going underneath the surface. So, like I said, uh, no, no government is a monolith, and there are always uh, good people uh, in the country and in different government or organizations that want to better their country. Um, now, from that conference, uh, we ended up uh, signing a memorandum of understanding on uh, education and extremism. Basically, we wanted to look at the question of how does religious and secular education help or hinder effects, efforts to counter extremism? Religious education or secular education, how does that help or hinder countering extremism and, and violence? So we had our opening conference in Beijing in July 2011, and uh, at that conference, uh, uh, many of the international participants here attended that conference, and we decided and we felt that uh, we wanted to have a comparative conferences, a series of conferences in South, Southeast, and Central Asia. And so uh, this Myanmar uh, conference uh, is an outgrowth of that. And so, um, so this uh, this is just to give you an example of, of how things uh, develop. And so my sincere hope and wish. And as we already see happening is that the safe space is being established and is leading and has potential lead to, um, to great things and to positive change. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jason.